Uh, welcome back um, to the somewhat slightly bizarre <coughs> afternoon session. Um, I would ask you to try... I'm sure you'll have questions, okay? But if we can leave questions as much as possible till I say, have you got questions, or until after the afternoon uh, coffee break, that'd be fantastic. Because otherwise I'll probably lose my train of thought and forget to tell you something that's vitally important and uh, useful. Also, as I'm sure you all will, a um, bit of common sense comes in here. I'm gonna, I may on one or two of the examples give you an example of how that particular technique, whatever it may be that makes up part of what I did, can be used for seduction or can be used for therapy or could be used on stage or could be used in sales. Um, but I'm pretty confident to say that you're all intelligent enough to, if I, on some of them, just explain the technique on what it's meant to do and why it's meant to do it in terms of changing somebody's emotional attachment, uh, belief, desire, or reaction to something. The, as long as I give you a few examples on a couple of them, you should be able to like go, well, yeah, I can see that that's what it's supposed to do, so if I applied it to, you know, therapy, it would be a case of that can be used to turn negative to positive, so if I applied it in speed seduction, it would be used for getting somebody who, who seemed a bit offish to be more interested in me, and if I used it in sales, it would be a case of getting them to be more likely to buy the product. That bit's common, uh, common sense. So. Before we do indeed uh, begin, because I can and because I've got no running order this weekend and this seminar has turned into something totally screwed up that I'm going to probably regret for the rest of my life because everyone will start buying this instead of the fucking other things. Um, it's just about everyone in the room at some point has volunteered. We will, anyone that hasn't can volunteer later. But of those that volunteered yesterday, Okay, um, which I know you did, sir, and I know you did, uh, Maria. Um, how many of you have had the experience of a client coming to you and perhaps they've been to another therapist and it didn't work? You've had that a few times, yeah? Um, how many of you have had that experience of the person says, well, I do actually feel as though I was hypnotised, but it just didn't work what was done. No, it was just more a case of they didn't even feel like they were hypnotised. They were questioning. They were questioning. Yeah, they were questioning, were they hypnotised? Okay. May I ask if it's okay? Um, sorry, I just can't fucking help it when I'm talking normally. May I ask? Yeah. It's okay! Yeah, you better come out, I just can't fucking... Sorry, I just can't help it. I just, it happens. It's a virus. Um, what approach you took to sort of uh, reframe, as they call it, in an LP, the belief systems that we would think that can be hypnotised, or that what you were doing had hypnotised them? Hmm. I can't think of a specific, specific example. Um. I know, just using your, your CMT method, making them sort of believe that what was going to work was going to be 100% successful. Mm -hmm. Right, because... Alright, okay. Because uh, I was going to say, the, the way I would have done it is to ask them what they recall of what the previous therapist had done in terms of, well, what did they do? Did they get you to sit down, lie down? Did they... Uh, get you to stare at a light or the ceiling? Did they get you to visualise this, that? What, what did they do in terms of helping you enter hypnosis? Find out what that is and then use it against the person, which is sort of pretty much like sales, asking questions, getting the information of what that person wants and then proving to them that the product is what they need. In the same way, you, you find out often what the other person did so that you don't do the same because obviously if they've been somewhere and it didn't work 
whatever was done, we're going to have an attachment to it, the thought process, an idea in the mind that it's not going to work. Just as if you were selling something to somebody and they said, oh, somebody's offered me the exact same thing before. Rather than trying to carry on selling it to them, ask them, well, what did the person say? I suppose how I do, actually, because I specialise in alcohol issues, and I've been there myself, they uh -huh. sort of buy into the fact that I've been there, that somehow what I'm doing is different to what they've had before, which right. didn't work. So, so I sort of... I that sort was of implied. Use yeah. yeah, it's implied. If it's non-Pacific law, you know, by finding out of the person, whether it's therapy or whether it's selling them something, it's the same bloody thing, that we, that's what you're doing, you're selling a, a thought process, a change, a belief system. Find out of them what it is exactly, specifically, precisely that they either didn't like, didn't want, resisted to, or why they just made that particular decision to not react, or why it didn't work, or why they didn't buy, or <clears throat> if you're in a fortunate enough position to do so and you've got friends with him, or why your approach is wrong if it was speed seduction. Ask the questions. Get the answers. You've got two ears, one mouth. Always let them do more talking at the beginning. Find out, and then use that information against them. Sounds negative, that, but I mean in a positive way. Use that information against them so that you don't do the same thing. You might actually, let's face it, at the end of the day, you are doing the same thing. If you were selling them a car, it's still a car. It might be a different car, but you're selling them a car. If you're doing therapy, you're still, at the end of the day, trying to help them achieve X, Y, Z. The same X, Y, Z as it was over there when it didn't work. It's just you've got to get them to a place in their head where they think that you were different yeah, cause what and you are the one. They can generalise and say, well, it, hypnosis doesn't work. You can, you know, sometimes I, I might say, depending on the, cl the client, mm -hmm. all hypnosis is not the same, all the therapists are not the same. So again, breaking that generalisation mm -hmm. down, that this is different. Well, I'd take that to another level. Uh, where, I mean, obviously, if that's been working for you, tremendous. Absolutely D tremendous. Yeah, I use different, depending on the client yeah. and what they're feeding back to me, I will use different mm -hmm. tactics. Well, the third person is always... Third person is always better than you saying something yourself. So if you say it to somebody, whether it's in selling something or it's in therapy, well, actually, you know, not all therapists are the same, or... Not all salespeople are the same, or not all cars are the same, or whatever it is. Or not all men are the same. You know, it, it just doesn't matter what the context is. You're the one saying it, and if you're the therapist who's then hopefully going to be helping them, or selling them the item, or trying to trap off it, whatever the context, right? It sounds less believable being said in the first person than if you come out with something like, in therapy, for example, um, well, you know, I hear what you're saying, acknowledgement of the fact you've been listening, uh, I hear what you've been saying, and you know what, several people have said to me before they've been to uh, other therapists, and it, it's interesting that just sometimes uh, people are unfortunate enough, like yourself, to, to go to the wrong, wrong therapist for them. And my approach is, you know, it's somewhat different. And you know, I had somebody here the other week, and obviously I can't tell you because of client confidentiality, you're getting the trust embedded in. Um, but we'll call him John, he was here and he had this, and he waffled on some shitey story about how the life was this bad. And now, you know, they've gone to five, six, seven different therapists, but they came to you and, you know, within a session it was sorted. NLP calls it metaphor, um, or, or magic stories sometimes they refer to them as. Uh, magic stories, because what you're actually doing is creating mental, emotional images in them of this is how it was for this person, which just happens to be remarkably the same as it is for them at that time, whether that's in therapy, giving them a, shall I say it, bullshit story if need be, made up of that you just had a client in the same position, or if you're selling something that, you know, that, funnily enough, I've had people like that before. It's making them feel comfortable because people like to feel like we were saying yesterday to be part of, they're not the odd one out, the part of a group. So even though you're not physically bringing somebody to them, the 
fact that you're talking in the third person makes it more believable that there's other people like them. Um, and then you can easily twist that so they come to that belief system that, all right, okay, this is different. And then they will start listening and obviously with what you glean from them in terms of what they said the other therapist did, you just make sure you don't do the same. Which, you know, who knows? One day it might be that the person turns around and describes to you word perfectly what would be classified as being a CMT session. In which case, you don't do that. You, you make something up on the spot like we're going to cover and you do something different. It's, every individual is different, just as in sales. It's all well and good having certain sales scripts. I used to um, write the sales scripts for Booper in Manchester and uh, National Free Call Centre, which was part of Mercury Communications. The sales went through the roof when I reworded them because they were embedded commands and all this kind of shite going on. But they wouldn't work all the time. Nothing works all the time with everybody. Anyone who says he does, he's just trying to sell you a false dream, ambition, idea, it's, it's bollocks. There's always going to be an exception to the rule. So that's why as a therapist, the key is to be flexible. Just as it is in seduction, selling, it's about thinking on the spot and using verbal communication techniques to capitalise, to improvise, improvise is a key word, improvise, which a lot of what we did before lunch, I was improvising. A basic toolkit of communication tools, and based on whatever the person sat in the client's chair says, I go, most appropriate response would be this, which will become even clearer as I break them down, obviously, as to why each particular one does particular things. Um, cool. Right, where did we start? Where we'll start is going back in time slightly. In intent. Intent. I spoke about intent yesterday. As the therapist, when that person comes through that door, well, rather even when they ring you up, but, um, you know, from, you should start from there. The moment you're speaking to somebody who is a potential client, you should always phrase things in a manner whereby they're cured, or in a manner whereby you come across that you're so confident that you're going to get the result that you want, or that you know that your product is best, but without doing the salesman's bit of saying, you know, how oh, is it the fucking best? No. Just that air of, you know, it's not, how can I put it? The best way of putting it, I suppose, is that you don't give a shit, but I don't mean that in a nasty way. By not giving a shit, I mean coming across so you're not bothered. You want to help as the therapist, but if they want to go elsewhere, fine. Um, you know, you, you want to help them save money on buying this particular item they decided they want, but, you know, it's not the end of the world. You don't need that sale because you're so successful at what you do, or rather the product you're selling is so good that you're selling so many of them, you're really, really not bothered. So that they then don't feel that pressure is being put on them. You've got to give people as much freedom as possible. The more freedom you give somebody, in the conversation last night, I was saying to a few people, you know, in a relationship, even if you're scared, concerned, gone through stuff, and you're jealous about your partner, or you're thinking, what are they getting up to if they go out on Friday night with the lads? The more freedom you give that person, the more likely they are to come back to you, because otherwise, sooner or later, they're going to feel pressurised. It might start off as, oh, isn't it nice, they're concerned. In the end, you end up pushing them away. In sales, too many people fall into the trap of laying it on, mega, mega hard sell, and people just end up seeing through it, and it's the desperation factor. Why is that going on? Because if the product's so fucking good, why do they need to do that? And it pushes them away. 
in therapy, some therapist that saw, <clears throat> I'm not going to use the word incompetent, because that isn't strictly true, so insecure within themselves that they will keep sessions running and not necessarily just on a you've got to come back next week for more because I want more money off you. I mean not about people who genuinely sincerely want to help people and not rip them off. Uh, because deep down they just haven't got that total confidence within themselves that it can work there and then. Just as, you know, some salespeople are scared to ask for the money. Come, they go past the buying point where people's eyes have lit up, which is the time to ask for it. It's sometimes going to be like just a couple of minutes in. Same with trapping off if it's speed seduction. Sometimes, just sometimes, you can meet somebody, you get that look, and um, you don't even talk to them all night. You just walk up to them and say, your place or mine. And it's about having the bottle. It's about not fearing rejection. It's about being flexible enough to improvise, to take anything that some other people may call negative and immediately turn it so it's positive. Or whatever happens is positive. It's fantastic. It's tremendous. Which I kept using rather a lot before, as you may recall. Uh, on some of the occasions, as I break this down and become more clear, on some of the occasions, it was exactly the response I wanted there and then. On other occasions, it wasn't exactly what I had in mind. So I had to then be flexible, improvise, twist it around, and use other linguistic communication techniques to make it... Um, sort of happen. But the first most important thing is that you as the therapist must be confident that you are flexible enough. You as the therapist must believe that you can help people. You as the therapist must have the intent that you're going to be able to help people. Same as in sales, you've got to go there with the belief that this is the best product of that nature. If you can't brainwash yourself into that fact, or you don't personally believe it, you're selling the wrong product. You can only sell something, whether that's a product, idea, service, or change of thought, pattern, emotion, or belief, in therapeutic terms, if you personally believe that that is the best way. And the best way certainly in therapy, but again with sales, because every human being on this planet is different, has different emotional triggers, belief systems, experiences, uh, and thought patterns, is to make what you do fit to that person. Which is why, as I now admit on this particular seminar, yes I do use a CMT session for just about every person. Yeah, that was true, what I said, I've said on other seminars. It's just that before the CMT session takes place, as I said before, I would do something relatively quick that takes five, ten minutes max, along the lines of what was done before lunch, as a convincer to them that an instant change has taken place, so that when they know within themselves a change has taken place, even if that was only one number, even if it only went from a nine to an eight, it doesn't matter what the result is, and quite often you'll find it goes from whatever number down to zero, even. Even then, you just, your response is always the same. Fantastic. That's tremendous. You know what? That's really good. As low, you, you, you're praising them. It's ego praising, making them feel good inside. As low, that, that's better than what you expected. Because then, the non-verbal, verbal, in that phrase again, the non-verbal verbal is that, wow, if this is better than uh, actually what was expected, then this must be working really well, so whatever else we do is going to work really well. It's all about setting, you know, setting them on that path. Intent-wise, you must believe you can help that person. Um, okay, I'm going to borrow two people. Um, from the audience, 
just to reiterate what intent is. So I'd like to borrow. Maria, please. That's all right. Yeah, only because you look that way, isn't it? No, hey, mate. <laughs> I knew you would do that. And. Um, Tremendous. David, if I yep. could, is that okay? Can you give them a round of applause to come to the front? <laughs> if you'd both like to uh, take a seat, <coughs> make yourself comfy wherever you'd like to sit, that's tremendous. Okay, intent. I covered that yesterday. I'm not going to do the same as I did yesterday. Oh, perhaps I will. Perhaps I won't. No, I won't. Um, it's all about what you have inside your head. People pick up on these things. Yes, this is the stuff that sounds x filish I know. But, if you go into a room and you see people and you think, what a bunch of tossers. And you're sat there and you set off that vote process in your head. Sooner or later, you will start, those people will start booking coming up giving you grief. Or looking at you funny. Or at least, you know, people might argue that that's the way you'll perceive it because you've already set off the thought process. But there again, I actually do honestly believe that the people pick up on the fact that you're being negative towards them, so they become negative towards you. It becomes like a magnet. Same, you know, and how bad is that? If the client picks up that you think, hmm, look at how they're dressed a bit fucking funny. Anything that's negative, you, it's just got, it's not going to help you. Same in selling. If you go into somebody's house, you know, no fucking shall to see it. Did you see certain environmental surroundings and you pre 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 um pre judge that that means they've not got the fucking money or available money or you know, they could be fucking multi millionaires who've just won the lottery and you don't know. But you pre judge, you set off your own thought pattern and you don't end up putting as much into it, you miss some that they've said or whatever, because it's like, oh, I've got to go through with this. Whereas in actual fact, they could have ended up turning out to be the best customer you ever had. Just as by listening and not prejudging and giving out positive, the person in front of you, however difficult their problem. And is it alright if I, if I relate what you were saying to me during the break before? Yes. Yeah. 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 Seeking permission first. Yes. Um, Maria specialises particularly with drug addicts Alcohol. and alcoholics. Alcohol. Oh yeah, but you've, you've done some. Addicts, yeah, the, uh, obviously a lot of people who as a byproduct they're also taking um, you know, cocaine and right. yeah, other drugs. And obviously because, we're, and you mentioned this before, uh, you've had personal yes. experience. Yes, very severe, I had very severe alcohol addiction myself. I've been there. Now that's another key point. You say, as a therapist, we need to know our own limitations. It is far better if somebody comes to you with a problem that you personally have no first or I'll even say second hand knowledge of. And by first hand I mean you personally experience, whether that's physically, emotionally or whatever. And second hand wise by that I mean in terms of it being a member of your very close family, friends, partner i.e. on a level whereby there's an emotional t uh, there was an emotional attachment for you in, the, in some way. It's far better if you can or don't know of on those two levels something or someone about that then how exactly can you totally fully understand I'm not saying you ever will totally understand, but how can you even understand to a level where your client's coming from? So whether you're consciously aware of it or not, you'll be sat there in front of your client, and somewhere in the back of your mind, even if it's subconsciously, you're going to be thinking, okay, I'm going to try and help you, or, which is a negative fucking suggestion to yourself anyway, if your try implies that you won't be able to. Or you might say, I am going to help you, because you're mega confident. But somewhere in the back of your mind, you've got this real running that's like, this is alien to me. I could never imagine sticking a needle in my arm and taking heroin. Or, you know, I couldn't imagine sniffing white powder up my nose. 
And, you know, I know second hand is not having read about celebrities doing it in the newspaper. It's, there's got to be a definite emotional attachment. Because it's emotions, and emotions are just energy in motion, that make us give whatever body language out that we give, that make our eyes light up or move in whatever direction they do, that make us, whatever's running through our head at that time, breathe at whatever rate we do, that make us feel the way we feel inside. And it's those things that other people pick up on. Whether they've had NLP or fucking body language training or not, it's got nothing all to do with it. It's those things that people pick up on at a subconscious level that make the difference between whether somebody walks into a room and thinks, well, this looks like a room for fun, happy people, or they look at somebody and think, bloody hell, for some reason, hmm, don't like the look of that person. We've all had those experiences. And you cannot, 100% of the time, avoid that from happening. There will always be some time when you don't have first or second hand experience, where you don't have an emotional link on some level. There will always be some time where the person that comes and sits in front of you, you look at, and for some reason, because they maybe look like you're flipping X, or because they look like somebody who attacked you one night years ago, you just it flicks off negative things in your head which your best course of action then is to actually turn around and say you know having listened to what you've got to say I think that my colleague who specialises in this would be better off dealing with this refer them to somebody else obviously get a commission out of it so you still make some money out of it um, which is A, going to make you feel better because you're not going to have to sit there for an hour feeling uncomfortable if it's triggered off something negative. B, <laughs> here we go again. So much different than other seminar. It's actually more ethical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet you never word. thought you'd hear me <laughs> saying something like that. But it is actually more ethical and more morally correct to send the person to the best person to be able to help them. And the fact is that you are the best person to help them as long as you've got an emotional link on some level, whether that's personal experience or an emotional link to somebody within your, your circle, family, friends, whatever, that has has. Because then you will have an understanding, an empathy, a connection with that situation with the energies that the client will be giving off. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, yesterday we sort of, I think, demonstrated how important energies and connection are in terms of, you know, helping or getting people to do things. Okay, before I actually start breaking these things down into separate bits, I'm only going to ask this question because then I'm phrasing it the way that I'm used to um, if I'd never met you before and the circumstance was that you'd been hypnotised before. Yeah. Um, it's just a demonstration of what you can do if you come into contact with people who have been hypnotised before, which interrelates with what you were saying before. Because that's where pattern interrupts, because that's the only one thing we didn't really do before lunch, was pattern interrupts. Um, other than that, all the other stuff we'll be covering pretty much sums up anything that's of use in NLP. So, uh, thanks for volunteering yet again, that's tremendous. Just flick deeper, 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 deeper. Drifting down, sinking down, drifting down, sinking down, drifting down, sinking down, drifting down, sinking down. That's tremendous. All noise, you're just helping you to drift down, sink down, drift down, sink down. Even if I'm talking to the audience, the sound of my voice just helps us assign and the signal to relax more completely. A lot of patternings, well, people don't expect you to uh, nearly pull their arm out of its socket when you go up and shake them by the hand. So uh, when people suddenly disorientate you, confused and shocked, especially when they've already told you they've been hypnotised before, which means that they've got an emotional connection, they've got a personal experience linked to that, which means they already know what to expect, they already know how to react, they already know how to feel. 
then cut to the fucking chase. Uh, tremendous. The trouble is now, obviously, normally you wouldn't have two people sat next to each other in a normal everyday situation. That wouldn't really be the case. So, you know, now it's one of those, he knows exactly what's going to happen. So, you know, rather than being shot, all I'm going to do is do it somewhat slightly differently and say, do me a favor, just look at your hand like that if you would, that's brilliant. Take a nice deep breath in. You told me you've been hypnotized before, yeah? Yeah. So, you know how relaxing it is. Yeah. And you know that your eyes close, you have your headphones fold onto your chest. Yeah. Yeah. That's tremendous. Just stare directly at the palm of your hand. And all that's going to happen is I'm just going to bring that in towards you as I do, just you start to find that your eyes get so heavy, so tired. And just lower your hand down over your face. Drifting down, sinking down, drifting down, sinking down, drifting down, sinking down. Tremendous shit up. Nice one. Eyes remaining tightly closed at all times unless I say otherwise. Eyes remaining tightly closed at all times unless I say otherwise. Right, we're not actually going to do any therapeutic work with them. Uh, it's just that. I just wanted to demonstrate, sometimes you will get what we were saying before, people coming in saying they've been hypnotised before and it didn't work. The irony of it is you'll also get people coming to you, no doubt, at some point, who um, have been hypnotised before. And it's just that the therapist has moved on, not in business anymore, or they're actually hypnotised on stage. Because quite often a lot of people, um, and I know this from certainly the Hypnotorious News Group, a hell of a lot of people end up going to therapists because of a stage hypnotist who at the end is selling stop smoking and weight loss tapes but then they approach them and go, I've got this problem, I've got that problem and the stage hypnotist who, and the majority of them don't have a fucking clue about therapy, doesn't know what to do, says, oh look in your local yellow pages, I'll do this and it does actually help the therapist get clients. Now the thing is, if they've already hip been hypnotised by a stage hypnotist, who tends to use rapid inductions anyway, much quicker than what therapists do, they've got a preconceived idea. And now a lot of therapists fall into the trap of going, oh no, this is completely different. This isn't like stage stuff. Hang on, that's not what they want to hear. They've come to you because they believe that hypnosis can help them, which it can. So rather than spending like 15, 20 minutes like a lot of therapists do telling them what it isn't, or rather than selling somebody a product and spending time telling them what it doesn't do and, uh, and, and, what, you know, uh, and what have you in terms of others, spend the time on positives, which, drifting down, that's tremendous, um, which would be cut to the chase, they already know how to react. In terms of selling something, it would be, you know, quite simply focus on. It's so obvious, but it's the things that people forget sometimes. We fall into a trap of forgetting. Um, what are the benefits to them personally? Because every human being is different. Everyone's got different emotional triggers. So that means actually by now you could be, you know, you could be sat in your office having a brew. 15 minutes because you know you've just saved yourself 15 minutes on your induction of a brew and then carry on with the session. Uh, right, only talking to you if I uh, touch you on the shoulder. Only if I touch you on the shoulder and I'm talking to. I'm talking to you, sir. When I'm waking you in a few moments' time, you'll be your normal self in every way. One, two, three, wakey, wakey, rise and shine. Tremendous. I'd like to send you back to the audience. Give this gentleman a round of applause. Thank you for allowing us to do this. Um, yeah, indeed. What we uh, did there, incidentally, <clears throat> I just realised I sent you back before, uh, with it, before explaining, but it's fine, I'll do it on myself. Because of the context, I had to improvise, because it's uh, going to be a bit obvious what's going to happen here. It's just happened. You want it to be different. It's got to be unexpected. That's why I said pattern interrupt. It's not what people expect. Um, for example, in sales, a very successful technique is to start telling them one or two benefits of getting this product, and then actually turn around and tell them something negative. I actually, you know, to be honest, but well, this is where your listening, your observation comes in, in terms of you know that the negative you're going to give them is irrelevant to them anyway. So you've got actually, it just occurred to me before I carry on. 
I'm not entirely certain that this is what you want. But he command, this is what you want. I'm not entirely certain this is what you want. In Cheshire, it was. This is what you want. Um, because there's actually this thing about it, and it might not suit you. But you've already been listening and asked them the questions up front. So you know that the what, that negative you're going to say to them is not actually a negative. They couldn't give a shit about it. But the knock-on effect is they think what a wonderfully nice person you are for not wanting to waste the time. What a wonderfully nice person you are for being so honest with them. It gets you that total rapport. And effectively by saying, no, that's not an issue. And you go, oh, are you sure? And they'll go, yes. You've got another yes then in the yes there. The more yeses you get, the more likely you are to sell. Or even in therapy, if you recall back earlier, there were certain times where I was questioning and reiterating, repeating it back and saying, is that correct, yeah? So I was getting a yes, 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 yes. So in terms of that um, second instant induction, uh, most ideally suitable on people who've never been hypnotised before, although if some of you have seen um, a certain one, uh, Messrs. Darren Brown are on television or in the theatre, um, he, uh, like me, has a tremendous balls of steel and uh, basically uses tactics like the two we've just demonstrated on people he's never met before. And 99.9% .9 of the time, so I believe, from what I've seen and heard, he gets away with it. Tremendous. Because his intent is so high within himself and the belief it gets transmitted rather like yesterday when it was just, oh, thanks for getting up. Just went silent. I think we all remember what happened. I was thinking that will happen. And it did. Just the same as Darren Brown has it in his head. It's not going to go wrong. And you know what? Even if it did, who gives a shit? I'm good enough that I'll be able to improvise around it. That's what you've got to, you've got to believe that in your own head. Because when you believe that and you seem like you really don't care whether you're selling something or treating somebody, that gets picked up on. Your intent, your motivation inside gets picked up on. Okay. I'm just talking to you if I touch you on the shoulder. When you wake up you'll feel like you've had about six hours natural sleep. You'll feel absolutely fantastic. One, two, three, you're wide awake. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for that. But before you go back uh, to your seat, just stay there one moment if you'd be so kind. What we did with um, David, because he was expecting just a normal handshake, was to take him by the hand and say, actually, can you just look at your hand out in front of you? So we put it at sort of 90 degrees, like that. And by holding him by the wrist, we said, look, just stare directly at your hand. So that's the focus of concentration, fixation point, like a light would be or the ceiling or something like that. Fixation of attention concentrated on that spot and we've asked the, in that case the question, have you been hypnotised before? Yes I have. Yes sir. So you know how it feels and how you react when you're hypnotised? Yes. If you want to go for the third one because you're supposed to do everything in three then you can go have I got your permission to use a really fast form of hypnosis today and they go yes. At which point you know that means they're going to react get them to look at the hand, bring it in slowly, which actually, as long as they're fixating on that, does actually make most people go a bit cross-eyed, which ties the eyes, so they get some sort of physical feeling, which is a convincer that something's happening, which all interrelates with the stuff we said yesterday about uh, stage hypnosis. When it gets to their face, and the hand's covering their face, if there was an audience there, and you were doing this in a group or on stage, as far as the audience are concerned, this person could already be in trance. Uh, hypnotised because they can't see whether their eyes are open or not and that's what people will assume and go away and say and then you say because you've got hold of their wrist you're actually pushing their hand against their face so as you gently pull their wrist down their hand is what is pulling their own face downwards because you're using the pressure of their hand on their face to pull their face downwards but it's all happening so smoothly and quick that they don't really become consciously aware of that 
they just figure, oh, my head's going down, I'm going into hypnosis, because this is what I remember it to be like. You're relating it to something they already know, so it feels more comfortable, safe, and secure. In the same way as when you're selling something, if you can relate it to something they already know, especially if it's somebody they know who's referred you, because they've had something, and obviously it's going to be more comfortable, safe, and secure. And then obviously you take the hand away down into the lap, by which point, if need be, you can see from the side whether their eyes are open or not, you can just tell them to shove them. But the fact is they've already agreed to respond. When people agree and you've got the consent and permission, which is a vital thing, you get permission from them. When they say yes, you're 99% certain that you're going to get the reaction you want when you want it. The other approach was with the hand. I'm not going to, it's not going to work this. Look at me. It's not going to work on this occasion. You will be able to keep your eyes up. Tremendous. Okay. Walked up as well. I was just going to shake Maria's hand. It's not going to work because I'm going to do it in slow motion. <coughs> a normal handshake would be like that. What I did was lift her hand up into the air. So the elbow raises up. I brought her hand back this direction so that her elbow not to sort of at the chest area thus knocking the air out of her lungs, which is slightly disorientating and unexpected. And then pulled her hand this way, somewhat slightly forward, in a tuck, so her body moves forward, almost into the fetal position, like we spoke about yesterday. And then I gently tugged one, two, three times, as exactly the same time as I said, sleep, sleep, sleep. That was, I was completely, completely shocked. Also, it also felt like ripped my arm out of my socket. It does. Uh, so there's that element of fear. I better do what the person bloody says. But no, no, no. no. It's um, that, that's why they call it a pattern interrupt. It totally confused. What the fucking hell's going on yeah. here? Um, I thought I was returning back to my seat. So yeah, that was complete and utter unexpected shock. Oh well, anyway, thank you. No, no, you can't. No, 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 no. You're going back to your seat now. Yeah. Sleep, 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 sleep. sleep. No, you're well out of it now. I see. When somebody's too scared, it won't work. No, you're fine now. I can't hypnotise you again now. Psychologically, that's just gone into your subconscious that I cannot hypnotise you again. Did anyone notice what I've just done then? No, 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 no. What I just said, rather. <laughs> right. It comes to the first technique that's relevant to some of these. Um, embedded command. I'll, I'll reiterate it again. Now that that's gone into your subconscious, I cannot hypnotise you again. The brain does not process certain words. Cannot. Not. Warns. It doesn't really, the sub, subconscious don't recognise them. Cannot, not, warned. So if you slot them in at certain places, it sounds like you're saying something that's totally acceptable, but in actual fact, what your subconscious will recollect, restore, store and take in, uh, in that example is, I can hypnotise you again. Thus, turning around the situation of a few seconds earlier. Um, yeah, it's called negation. It's really, really cool when you use it in state of as well. Negation? Yeah, I've used it hundreds of times. Well, that's the speed seduction <laughs> term. It's, uh, in NLP, it's called, um, yeah, what the fuck is it called? I forget. I class it as being sort of a, a reverse embedded command because it's perceived by the person you're saying it to as you're saying something totally acceptable to them that they've got no reason to resist. There's no one got any reason to risk the phrase like, oh, I cannot hypnotise anymore. It just, it won't happen when I do it again. Um, but the won't, the cannot, the not, doesn't get processed. So it's like what actually goes in is the sentence with those words missing, which is an entirely different sentence. Which does mean what you actually intend to have occur. Um, another example of embedded command is 
like when we did CMT, and this isn't a sales ploy. It's going to sound exactly like one, but it isn't. I mean, truly, it's not. For those of you who perhaps not got any of uh, my DVDs or have certain ones missing, we have certain limited numbers of them available after. Now, with reference to the CMT session in particular, and examples of embedded commands, if you don't have the DVDs, then it will be incredibly beneficial to you to get the uh, NLP and Hypnosis Exposed set or the Secrets of Hypnotic Success set, or there's no such thing as hypnosis set, because on each of those, in some different contexts, I do a CMT session. And the thing is, you can sit down, watch it, pause it, and go, hang on a minute, it's just said that, and listen to it, and see what words I say louder than others, or quieter than others. Remove those from the sentence, and you get an entirely different sentence with an entirely different meaning just by juggling about one word, which quite often is the words like don't, won't, can't, cannot. Doesn't is another good one. Doesn't, yeah. They're all the sort of it won't happen, it doesn't, it won't, it can't. They're all the negative things um, that the brain doesn't process. So, hence, don't do that anymore. You're actually saying do that anymore, which is nonsensical, so therefore it doesn't make any sense, it gets no reaction other than the person carries on doing what they were doing most of the time. Um, so in the CMT session, an example of that would be embedded command. It's always harder in my head to break down the different sections because it becomes so easy now. I don't know if you want to go into a trance now, or in a few moments time, but go into a trance, you will all of a and I'm really overemphasizing the bit that said louder there, that would be a bit too obvious, but you can also do it not by removing words or adding words, but just by emphasizing with your voice, voice tone certain bits louder or quieter, so that the one sentence is perceived here as, I don't know if you want to go into a trance now or in a few moments time, but well, you will go into a trance, it just sounds very casual, but by emphasising a tiny bit of it, um, and pausing it, putting pauses in, I don't know if you want to go into a trance now or in a few moments time. But going to a trance, you will all the same as you relax more. And that's, right, Embe right. embedded command, embedded command, embedded command, that was embedded command. Another one, the negation is like, I don't want you to think, or try, mm. something like, I know you don't think this is the greatest product ever, or something like that, because then it completely links it up, this is the greatest product ever. Yeah, so that you use negative words at the beginning. Good so example. You could, you could do that in induction as well, then, Jonathan. So you could say, you believe you will not go into a trance now, and that would work as well. Even though you've told them that they believe they won't. Wouldn't is similar to couldn't. So, yesterday, when I had some people here, you may recall, after a place, one person in a trance has said to the other, you wouldn't do anything daft like that, would you? Yeah. yeah. Um... <coughs> You wouldn't, wouldn't go, you wouldn't, you do anything daft like that. It's not a question, it's not a statement, it's an implication. And the person goes, no, because they think they're responding to, you wouldn't do anything like that. Mm. They feel relaxed, so at that moment in time, you can pattern interrupt them. So you can use it to confuse, you can use it to embed ideas, um, you can use it however you want, but that's essentially what an embedded command is a means. Uh, that's why I was saying yesterday about reading the dictionary and knowing the meanings of different words. Because when you say a sentence a certain way, it can also be a case of when these couple of words that the brain doesn't process come out, that this sentence gives a whole different meaning to some of the words later on in the sentence, if you see what I mean like, you know, uh, 
I wonder, or rather, when it's done in the induction, as you relax more, I wonder if you know the answer, right? So, as you relax more, this is called um, binding or linking, layman's terms. Binding or linking suggestions together on a somewhat slightly complex level, but we're doing it with embedded commands involved as well. Mm. As you relax more, that's a suggestion. As you relax more, I don't know, don't get deleted, I know. As you relax more, I don't know, pause, if you have the answer, slight voice tone change, embedded command, the don't comes out, as you relax more, which is a suggestion, you have the answer. Have the answer is slightly amplified. You have the answer, so it's an embedded command. Uh, on two levels, A, it goes in quicker, and B, it is a command that they will have the answer. So the subconscious will respond. It sounds like a logical sentence, but by putting those pauses in, voice tone changes. And that's why scripts, you know, the only reason hypnotherapy scripts fucking work is if your intent and belief system tells you that they will. Or if somebody's actually taken the time to sit down, like I bloody have in my book, and when they put scripts in, put certain parts in italic or bold to tell you when to change your voice tone, when to put a pause in, so that you get the correct embedded command impact or binding and linking. Right, another example of binding and linking, which is technically, the other name I give them is, well, it's two in one this. Binding and linking is taking one suggestion and linking it to the other, so that, because of your observation, you know something is definitely occurring. So you can say that to the person. And when they think to themselves, yeah, it is. That's convinced them. That's called a convincer in NLP. And then you link or bind to it the next thing you want to say. So in other words, it's like using the phrase, which means that. Which is used a lot in sales training and stuff. So you know, oh, you, you're really happy with that, yeah? And then it's now like, no. Yeah. So which means that if. We, we would supply that to you uh, by the end of the week. Which means that is a link in sales, but in therapy, it's nonsensical bullshit in so much as it's illogical. It's the illogical things that become logical and work on a subconscious level. So, uh, you, with your eyes, can see that the person sat there in front of you is physically obviously relaxing more because they've gone from this to. Use your eyes. So you've observed this. So you know it's probably a good time to say something like, that's fantastic, ego strength in praise. As you relax more. Yeah, I am doing. How did they know? Yeah. That's the sort of, yeah, but it's the sort of thought process that goes on in the human brain. How did they know? Fantastic, magical person this. As you relax more, and it's true. And while they're registering that, yeah, that's true, that's the perfect time to put something in, but at this moment in time, may not be true, but is what you want to have become their reality. So, you know, as you relax more, you can realise, can is a power word, positive, you can realise. It's not saying that they will, because they may not have that experience there and then, right that particular second, and if they didn't, and you'd said that they would or will right there and then and they didn't, they'd think, this person don't know what they're going on about. And that would be a negative and that, mm. So we always phrase things ambiguously enough 
that it leaves it up to the client to decide for themselves and interpret it on a, in a way, a phrase used a hell of a lot, in a way that's right for you, or in a way that feels right for you. Whatever the fuck that means, I've never understood, but at the end of the day, it leaves them to do it in a way that's right for them. <laughs>